Good morning, church. Let's thank the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my
Good afternoon to everyone joining us today, and good morning to everyone that's joining us at home. My name is Luke. I'm the youth and children's pastor here, and I would like to open us up this morning with some announcements that we have, as well as open us up in prayer. We are continually offering everything that we have online. I'd encourage you all to stay tuned to our various social media outlets, our our church website for information as we make changes, as we release videos, everything to help minister to you all. And as we seek to continue to minister online, digitally, virtually, I'd ask for your help to help us know how to minister to you all. Let us know if there's any, any need that we can meet, any prayer that we can lift up, anything we can do to better serve you, your family, and our community. This morning in particular, I would like to announce a, a deacons meeting that's happening Sunday evening in, a, in the fellowship hall. This is a great time that we have to be wise in making our decisions. Uh, throughout the whole season that we've been in, our deacons have been faithful to meet to pray, to discuss. Our desire is absolutely to have everything back up and running, back to normal, back to what we are know and are familiar with. But oftentimes our desires are not the wisest course. So it has been so good to meet with one another and talk through where we see God leading, what opportunities we have, and how to faithfully steward everything God has given us. And so we are excited for that meeting to continue evaluating what we offer, what our ministries can be, and how best to serve others. You may have heard the announcement of our, of our state making decisions based on schools. And so this morning, I'd love to open up and pray and bring your attention to make sure that in your prayer time, you're praying for our schools, our educators, the children, our parents, everybody involved in that, which who is not involved in the decision of what our schools will be doing. That truly is a difficult decision. And I'm not envious of the people making it, but we absolutely want to obey that in prayer. As Christians, we believe our greatest resource is prayer. And then the last announcement that I have this morning is a big thank you to our church secretary, Erin Wagner. She has started a new, she's starting a new job on Monday, and so it is always so sad when you see someone go, someone that you've gotten close to, that you've worked alongside of for four and a half years. That's longer than I've been here, and so we are certainly sad, but know that God has big plans for her and are excited for what God has in the future there. So just wanted to extend a huge thank you to Erin for years of helping and serving and being faithful to serve the body of Christ. And so as we wind down our announcements, I would ask for all of you to bow your heads, to join me in prayer as we open our worship service and as we seek to thank God for what he's done and continue to pray for excitement and acceptance about what he is going to do. So if you all would bow your heads and join me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunities that you have given us, God, uh, Now, as we were a few weeks into being able to regather, being able to meet together, God, it truly is so sweet to come together as the body of Christ. God, we truly miss this so much. And so let us be thankful. Let us recognize the the significance of the church being able to come together. And God, let us not take for granted how good it is to meet. God, let us also appreciate how good it is to be united regardless of if we meet or not, that your spirit is not limited by location, not limited by geography. God, this is what gives us hope, that no matter where we are, that whether we are sent, whether we're home, whether we're here, that God, we are fully united in you. God, that truly is cause for praise and cause for hope. And so God, in that unity, we want to come together and ask that the decisions that we make as a church be wise, be faithful, be safe, and be earnestly seeking your glory. And then God, we pray that too, not just for our church, God, but for our state, our town, our locality, God, everybody, that everybody in leadership positions, God, be just so concerned with making wise decisions, wise decisions in light of who you are. God, that as we make decisions on reopening, on schools, uh, that impact so many people, God, we pray that your name, that your name be made known. God, we pray that no matter what the decision is, that your church would be able to be a voice, that no matter what circumstances look like, we know our hope is in you, our faith is in you, and that it's the duty of every Christian to be an example of what that looks like played out in the lives of our families, the lives of our neighborhoods, and the lives of our communities. God, we pray for our teachers to give them strength and wisdom. Pray for our students, God, to bless them as they are continuing to grow up in such a difficult time. God, we lift all these prayers up to you, knowing that you are not a God who's content to just watch what happens, God, but in fact, you sent your son Jesus into the world to bear 
the burdens that we are bearing now, to be victorious over the things that entrap and ensnare us, and then God, even unto death on a cross, that you might rescue us and redeem us. God, we are so thankful for all that you've done and all that you will do for us. So God, it's with that thanks and with that hopeful expectation of who you are, all through Jesus' name that we say these prayers. Amen.
set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living hope. My living hope. My living hope. In our passage today, Jesus is going to reach out and touch a leopard, a leper. And uh, may we be very careful as believers today to think that the leper was any worse off than we were. Because indeed, the Lord Jesus can reach out and touch us too. And oh, how we need it. Let's sing together this morning. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Let's sing together. I 
shall shroud it while eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. me and made me whole. Numbers. We live by numbers. We track and count and measure everything. And sometimes we think the only numbers that really matter are the big ones. But it's the single digits that make the difference. The Bible says that heaven rejoices with the number one. Yeah, heaven rejoices each time even one person comes to know Jesus. We pastors dream about big numbers, and we should, but a daily focus on one meaningful interaction for Christ, that's the true difference maker. One friend, one family member, one coworker, one person at a time. We want to see God move in our nation like we have never seen before, but it all starts with one. I've got my one. And now I'm challenging you and your church to join us and to find yours. Because ultimately, the only number that really matters is one. Who's your one? Good morning, everybody. Good to see you and good to be with you. So today, uh, we are in our third message and our series on Who's Your One. We first, when we began the planning for this, we thought that we would do four or five messages, but the more we talked and prayed about it and discussed it amongst ourselves, we decided to do this throughout the month of August. And the more that we get into this, the more that we realize that what we need more than anything are examples of how Jesus dealt with people one-to-one. So that's what we're going to be doing. The whole, the rest of this month and all through August, where we found passages and scriptures, and they're not hard to find, they're all over, where Jesus dealt personally, one-to-one, with people, and that's what we're going to talk about. So today, we're going to look at the, uh, the miracle, the healing of the leper in Mark chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. It's also in other accounts of the scriptures, but we're just going to look today at Mark, and we're going to talk about when Jesus reached one, everyone shunned and feared. Jesus reached one person that everyone else had shunned and feared, and we're going to look at the parts, the components, the elements of this miracle. It's really, really important. I I want to encourage you as you listen to these messages and as you go forward to begin, if you don't already, to see people as Jesus saw them. I think when we look at people the way Jesus saw them, it changes our entire perspective, and we'll see that today. I want you to look at the way Jesus saw things. The Gospels overwhelmingly show us that Jesus did not address the great issues of his day. There were a lot of problems of that day. There was all kinds of social problems. There were problems with the misuse and abuse of power. There were religious issues. Jesus did not spend his ministry addressing those big picture problems. But what he did is he spent most of his time preaching what the kingdom of God looked like in the lives of people, what it would look like to individual folks. He confronted religious hypocrisy and then dealt a great deal of his time with dealing brokenness one-to-one in the people that he encountered. If you can just picture this, that God came to the earth in flesh as a human being And for three and a half years, ministered among the people, and most of his time was spent one-to-one dealing with people and their brokenness and problems. That's a good model for us, church. That's, That's a good way for us to do. We often think of working corporately, and there are things that we can do corporately. But it's vitally important that we see Jesus as addressing one to one problems, and that's something that we ought to do, to build intentional relationships with the lost and least. So this is the third in that series. We, we had the message on Peter where Jesus restored 
Peter, one of his disciples, after failure and sin. That's good to know because we all fail and we all sin. So it's good to know that God restores us. It's good to know that the church allows restoration, that we restore people. That's important as well. We last week looked at the like of Zacchaeus, a man that was hated in his sin, and how Jesus met him personally, individually, how Zacchaeus came to faith, came to repentance, then came to turn around his whole life and serve Jesus, gave his money over to the poor and to restore and make restitution for what he'd done wrong. Today, we see the life of the leper. It's a powerful, impactful story. And so I want to look a little bit at this, and I'm going to read the text, and I want you to listen to it. And we're going to be back in the text, so keep your finger on it. I'm going to read it, and here we go. Mark chapter 1, 39 through 45. He, that is Jesus, went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And then a man with leprosy came to him and on his knees begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, see that you say nothing to anybody, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely to spread the news. And the result was that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but he was out in deserted places, and they came to him from everywhere. The power of God working one-to-one. -one. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. It's powerful, personal, potent to us. God, we know that you love us and come to us in our places of greatest need. Thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you'll open up this scripture to us like we've never seen and know how much you desire for us to come to you. And Lord, how much you desire for us to bring this message of hope to a world that needs to hear it one person at a time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to talk to you just a little bit about leprosy. I think we've got to understand that. It's a terrible disease, also known as Hansen's disease after the doctor that described it and wrote about it. It's caused by a bacteria. We would describe it today, doctors would say today, that it's mildly contagious. It's treatable with a bacterial uh, medication. It can even be corrected, the long-term effects by plastic surgery. And so today, even though it's still prevalent in third world countries, when medical care is available, it can be treated and made available. The disease actually damages nerves and the respiratory system and the eyes. It leads to a loss of limbs from repeated infections. We often think of it as, as kind of a, 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 a disease that uh, it just rots away body parts. It doesn't do that. But what happens is the extremities, the fingers and the toes, lose sensation, and people are injured. Maybe they pick up something hot in a fire, or they touch their hand in scalding water, or they grip something too tightly, and, and they're injured in that way. So that causes the injury. So over a period of time, from one year from the start of symptoms to, to it reaches its full blossom in about 20 years, it can be a horribly disfiguring disease. In the, day, um, uh, in the day of Jesus, it wasn't curable. It wasn't treatable. Dr. Bland says now that he's one of the, Dr. Paul Bland says the injuries result from the destruction of pain as a warning system in the body. So leprosy shows us that pain is a valuable gift. It tells us something's wrong. You got to do something about it. In third world countries, and I don't want to be too graphic because I know some of you may be eating breakfast while you're watching church here, but in some third world countries, vermin like mice and rats may actually eat on the fingers and toes of people that are affected by leprosy, and they don't know it. And so Dr. Bland, a plastic surgeon who's treated this disease for years, says that part of his post-operative protocol is to send people home with a cat so they can treat the illness in their home and prevent these injuries by vermin. Isolated from his family, forced to live away from his community, a leper in biblical times had no way to support himself. 
He probably had not felt anything for years. He, his body was probably full of these sores and injuries and illnesses and infections. He was mutilated literally from head to foot. He probably smelled. He was repulsive and dirty to everyone. You can hardly imagine the kind of pain and isolation and humiliation that he would feel. Required by law that he went into a public place, he had to call, call out unclean. Can you imagine that if you walked in a grocery store or mall, when you walked in the door, you had to shout out loud for everybody to see, I'm unclean. By Jesus' time, the rabbis had made it worse. If a leper stuck his head in a house, the entire house was unclean. It was illegal to, to greet a leper personally. Lepers had to remain at least 100 cubits. That's about 150 feet if you were downwind. If you were upwind, you had to remain, remain six feet from anybody. Josephus said that lepers were treated as if they were dead men walking. Christ's parables are often real-life stories about things that are important. R.C. Trench, a great Greek scholar, said that the dealing of leprosy in the New Testament is a dealing with sin, how Christ helps us deal with sin. Though the leper was not worse or guiltier than his fellow countrymen, he was a parable of sin, an outward visible sign of the inmost spiritual corruption. And what this is says is that we all without Jesus are spiritual lepers. We often are unconscious of our sin or unconscious of the dangers of our sin like the lepers are. When you read the test for leprosy in Leviticus 13, you see how it describes the process of sin. Leprosy is deeper than the skin. Like sin, it spreads, it corrupts, it isolates, it makes life fit only for destruction. Anyone in sin is spiritually worse than this man ever was, if you can imagine. The nature of leprosy is silent. As Dr. Warren Wiersbe says, its slow progress, destructive power, and the ultimate ruin it brings makes it a powerful symbol of moral depravity. In it, we see ourselves as spiritual eyes. We see that, apart from Christ, that we are decaying, walking forms of death. So Jesus dealt personally with a leper. We see that in this background that Jesus is beginning his ministry in Galilee, the northern part of Israel. By this time, he'd called a few, but not all of his disciples. He had turned the wine to Cana, as scholars tell us, and related over in, in John chapter 2. And it could be that that's what the leper heard about. We're going to see a little video in just a minute. Don't do this very often. It's about three minutes long. It's a clip from The Chosen. I want you to watch it. It details this parable, this miracle pretty well. I want you to notice a couple of things. I want you to notice the fear and the revulsion in Jesus' disciples when they saw the leper. I want you to see that the instructions that Jesus gave the leper once he was healed are right out of the Old Testament. A priest was required to validate that a leper was healed, though this was rarely ever seen. So watch the video and see this powerful story firsthand. Not to spoil this beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. It's a leper. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 Please. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. I am willing. <laughs> Be cleansed. Oh. <sighs> 
Seek your own honor. Please just do me this one thing. Uh, but what do I tell people? Go. Show yourself to the priest. Let them inspect you and see that you are cleansed. Make the proper offering in the temple as Moses commanded. And go on your way. Uh, uh. Who has an extra tunic? Just one of you, just one of you. That's enough. <sighs> Green is definitely your color. <laughs> Not too shabby. <laughs> So, powerful story. Um, the reason, one, one of the things that they said in the story, and I didn't mention, is that he asked for a new tunic. Lepers were required, in the book of Leviticus it says they were required to wear tattered clothing. So, Jesus gave him another tunic to wear. I want to give you the four basic parts of this miracle that I think are really important. The Bible tells us in verse 41, and it gives us, it gives us the rest of my sermon. There's four parts there. First, it says that he was moved with compassion. It describes compassion as a visceral gut feeling. Compassion is not, a, not an emotion, not something just light feeling. It's something you feel down in your soul. It literally could make you physically ill. That's the way that's described. It's not revulsion because it's gross or overwhelming, but he's revulsed and overwhelmed by the suffering that he saw. Some manuscripts say that Jesus was indignant. He's showing anger or annoyance at his, what he perceived as unfair treatment by this man. Compassion is a lot stronger than pity. It, pity is an awareness of the suffering of others, but compassion leads to action. Jesus feels this way to meet the leper's needs. Compassion is the first step. Feelings are not our only God. We're commanded to love people, our neighbors as ourselves, the feeling through compassion begins that process of putting love into action. When Jesus encountered this man, he felt compassion for him. If we lack compassion, we will never love people the way Jesus loved them. I want to say that again. If you lack compassion for people, for the people that Jesus loved, you and I will never love them the way he did. Compassion opens up our spiritual eyes Many people have good intentions, good doctrine, good education, good biblical foundations, but lack compassion. You got to have compassion. The Holy Spirit uses compassion to be the hands and feet of Christ. The Bible gives us a warning for the lack of compassion. Over in Matthew chapter 23, in verse 23, Jesus dealing with the Pharisees, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you've neglected the important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Jesus said, you guys have done all the right things. You, you pay attention to the law, you do all the important details, but you miss the weightier things, the, ma the big matters like justice, mercy, and faithfulness. It's very important. So we how, how do you grow compassion? I think the only way that you grow compassion is we do it through Christ. Christ, in an ongoing relationship with believers, gives us compassion for people that only he loves. 
Mother Teresa was asked how she ministered to the lost in the least of Calcutta, India. And she said, I'll never forget this, I look to them and imagine that they're Jesus. The rest of it's easy. I look to them and I just think of them as Jesus and the rest of it's easy. Compassion is an attitude that often preceded Jesus' miracles. It's a necessary first step to helping people. The gospel says that Jesus, the gospels, the four of them overall, at least 13 times in there, it said that Jesus had compassion. And many of those times it preceded a miracle, preceded him doing something. It came before the healing. And you know, one of the ways that we often, I think in the modern church, we divert compassion is that we point it inwardly and we are compassionate to each other. We love people that we know. We love people that we go to church with. We love our families and our friends. But it's important for the church to be compassionate to the people Jesus was, to the people that everybody shunned. And that's what he did here. Jesus saw a man that nobody would come close to, wouldn't even enter a room with him, wouldn't get in the, in the vicinity of him, wouldn't address him in any way, and he showed compassion for him. Number two, Jesus was willing. I, I love this text. The beggar said to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you are willing. And Jesus said, I am willing. The beggar knew something that's really important. He knew that helping him was more than just a function of ability. There were people that walked by that beggar that could have helped him, but they wouldn't do it. There were people that probably cared about him but did nothing. Helping requires willingness and compassion. I, I think willingness is like compassion. It's an attitude. It's, it's not an active thing. It's an attitude. He was willing to do it. When we're willing to show compassion, it allows us to see a need. It allows us to touch, to reach out, to help, to do something, to heal. We won't do anything until we're willing. If you or I are not willing, we may walk right by somebody in need. The leper knew that. He wanted to know, are you willing? Because I know you can do it. Are you willing to do something? To be willing meant that Jesus would stop whatever he was doing. Wherever he was headed, he would stop that. He would interrupt his routine and his schedule. We're often capable and compassionate, but not willing to get involved. Jesus had the perfect combination, and, and, and we have to look to that. That's why we study these texts. He had the perfect combination of compassion, of willingness, and power. For us, it's often more difficult. We're often impeded by our own prejudices, impeded by our own sinful thoughts, impeded by our lack of faith and ability. We get overwhelmed with the need. We become indifferent to suffering outside of the church. The leper was clearly not the person that respectable Jewish people would have compassion for, but Jesus was willing to help him. And I want to tell you, just like compassion, willingness only comes through Christ. I think, I think willingness can divert our, our um, priorities. It can divert our goals and our own energies and our own resources. It allows us a new heart and a new set of eyes. If you're not compassionate and willing, ask Jesus to give you a heart like that. Number three, Jesus reached out and touched the leper. I, you just can't underestimate the power of touch here. And, and I want you to notice the text here. It says, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing to help, he said. He reached, let me say, you can't reach the lost and the least of our world without touching them in some way. You can't, you can't stay at a comfortable, safe distance. Once we reach out and touch somebody, we see suffering in a different kind of way. First of all, I think we need to be touched. We need to know what it is like to be touched by Jesus. And I pray that all of you, everybody that hears this, could say, yes, at some point in my life, I've been touched by Christ. He's, he's done something in my life. Maybe, maybe he touches us in a time of personal quiet time. 
I think that's really good. Maybe in a time of worship, while we were sitting here and Brother AJ was singing, and I know we didn't have the choir and have all the voices of our church, but Christ can touch your heart in beautiful music like that. What a great privilege it is to come to worship like that. And that's why we need worship. That's why we need to come together, because he can touch us through worship. Maybe he does it through preaching. And in my life and in my, in my spiritual development, God has touched me a lot through preaching. I love to hear biblical preaching. Sometimes it's through preaching and we grasp truth for the first time. Sometimes we see things in a different light. The Holy Spirit can put ideas and plant scriptures in our mind. But whatever you need to cultivate to be touched by Christ, you and I need that in our personal walk. But touching for Jesus was risky. It made him ceremonially unclean. He would carry the effects of uncleanness in his own life. A touch contaminated him. We would understand it in today's COVID uh, lingo. We would say he had to be quarantined now because he was contaminated with his disease. Touching was radical for a person that you weren't supposed to get close, close to. It was not allowed by acceptable society. It may have been the first touch by a human being that this leper had had in a long time. If you intervene in the life of a person ruined and damaged by sin, it may be the first time that anybody's reached out to them. Know that. And reaching out is not always easy. But that's something that the Bible tells us to do. Jesus said in his final parable, whatever you did for the least of these brothers, you did for me. That's really important. So cultivate ways that Christ can touch you and cultivate ways that you can touch other people with his love. Cultivate ways that you can touch others with the love of Christ. People that we know desperately need touch. They desperately need our personal involvement. They desperately need us to get involved in their lives. Touch me goes beyond our doctrine or our beliefs or our morals, but we enter somebody's personal space with love and compassion. I think that's so powerful. That touch puts us in their world. We're often capable but we're not willing to touch with our resources, to feed, to house, to love, to provide care, to get us involved in action. And I know touching is more difficult in the days of corona. We can still call. We can send cards. We can do little gifts. We can do little remembrances. I, there's all kinds of ways that you can touch personal contact with people is vitally important. And I pray as a church that we'll go beyond just the superficial, the, the just talking with each other, just living within our own fellowship, but look and find a person outside the body of Christ that you can touch and personally be engaged with. Touch is very, very important. Number three, number four, excuse me, Jesus made him clean. Read the text here and, and listen how it happened. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he said, and he told him, be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. You're seeing here a miracle of the power of God. The key word here is immediately. The miracle happened right away. There was no process. There was no medicine. Come back tomorrow. Wait till daylight. There was nothing. He touched him, and just like we saw on the screen, I imagine that's pretty close to what it was. He touched him and was immediately healed. Years and years of a destructive disease left him in a few moments. Biblical miracles are stunning because they happen immediately. We do see miracles today, perhaps not miracles like that. Whenever someone goes into the hospital with a serious illness, we see medical science that God has given doctors and given nurses and given us the ability to treat problems that before used to be fatal, and now people can be treated and walk out of the hospital and be fine. Missionaries in persecuted countries see miracles on a different scale. They see miracles more like they did in the, Old, in the New Testament. And we don't always understand God's grace. Jesus didn't heal everybody he saw. There were people in the New Testament that he didn't heal. He came in contact with so much illness and so much suffering and so much destruction, he didn't heal everybody even then. And so people often say to us, well, 
Preacher, you know, if, if Jesus would just come back and do a miracle here, then we would all believe. But that's not the case because Jesus performed miracles, and as soon as he did, folks were ready to take him out and stone him. So miracles don't always bring faith. They show us the power of God. The power of God was evident here in this man's life and to these disciples. God still heals powerfully and miraculously. I was looking this week at uh, Nick Ripkin, who's going by an assumed name, a missionary. He's worked in, um, in foreign countries for years and difficult Muslim-held countries for many years. And he said that we often say miracles of God's power no longer exist. He says, if you've been saved in your sins and you're a miracle, then you are a miracle of healing and forgiveness. And remember that. If you've been saved from your sins, you are a recipient of a miracle of God's grace and mercy. Isn't that great? We can all be partakers in that. Dr. Ripkin said that when he wants to look at examples of miracles, he doesn't look at medical things, but he looks at the churches in persecuted countries. When they asked that question, he said, I began to weep and suddenly see all the things that I've allowed to become common that would be considered miracles in the eyes of millions in the persecuted church. He said, I never take for granted the Lord's Supper without thinking of the last communion in Mogadishu when four of my Somali friends would soon be martyred. I never partake of the bread or the cup without an awareness that I do so not just for myself but on behalf of the brothers and sisters around the world who do not have and may never have again access to the blood and body of our Lord Jesus Christ in the service of communion. He said, every time I open a hymn book, I think of Travian, an old singing saint, sitting in his prison cell, writing and composing over 600 praise and worship songs that are sung every week in persecuted churches in Eastern Europe. He said, on occasions when my heart's moved by some piece of social, special music, an offertory solo or an uplifting choir anthem, I think of Aisha, courageous voice rising from the dark dungeon beneath her city's police station. Or I think of the great choir of 1,500 inmates standing at attention, arms outstretched, facing west as they sang heartfelt worship back to God. When I reach for one of the Bibles on the bookshelf in my study and have to stop and decide which version I might want to read, I think of those Christians and Chinese house church pastors, each one going home to home from clandestine conferences. To, listen, clutching a handful of torn out pages, they will preach from those few pages until they receive another portion of Scripture. Church, never take God's Word for granted. I think of the youth conference in Moscow 50 years ago when a young Russian believer recreated the entirety of the four Gospels and by memory, by memory. <laughs> I think of the hundreds of believers who I've interviewed who could cite their verse or Bible passage that provided comfort and strength to survive and keep their faith alive through years of suffering and persecution. God's miracles of mercy. God's power. God's power happens all around us. And I think as a church, we need to tune ourselves in to God's work. And we need to look at our own lives and say, where, where are the places in my life that God's been working? Where is, in the, where is God working in the life of my children, my grandchildren, and, and my friends? Where can I see him working in the life of new believers in our church? It's a joy, and it should be celebrated in our church when God's working in the life of new people. What a blessing and a miracle of grace that God gives us such forgiveness. And whenever you share your faith, whenever we stop and intervene in the life of a person, whenever we lead someone to Christ, you are sharing with them God's power in mercy and forgiveness. And when they accept it, they receive God's redemption God's forgiveness, God's justification, being made right with God, God's sanctification to be made into the image of Christ. What a miracle, church, that we can come that way. God desires that we work for the miracle of salvation in the lives of other people. You know, there's a passage over in uh, 2 Timothy that I really like. Um, it says uh, in second, uh, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, this is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's, that's God's 
desire for everybody, that everyone to be saved. You and I are the tools of God's power. We have the Holy Spirit that lives in us. We have the ability to bring God's power and salvation to people. Let me take a few things away. I saw a quote this week. If the Son of God came as a servant, then being a servant is the highest of all of our callings. Servanthood requires that we get involved in the work of Christ. It means more than just being a servant to the people we know and like. Our calling as believers is to be servants to the people that Jesus was a servant to. And he found the people that were most undesirable, that were shunned, that were cast out, like this leper, and brought the love of Christ into their life. We have to be people like Jesus. We have to be moved with compassion. We've got to reach out to people. We have, we have to help people find the grace and mercy of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit that always empowers us for these things. We are placed in a world full of suffering, and we are literally the hands and feet of Christ as his church. I want to plead with you to find a person that Jesus would find, to find a person one-to-one and build a relationship with them and share God's hope and mercy with them. It's not a call to simply meet their material needs, though we might need to do that. But it's a call to lead a person to the miracle of salvation in their life, to cure them of the one disease that only Christ can cure. I saw a quote, another quote this week I wanted to share with you. Life is too short, eternity is too long for us to neglect presenting the gospel. Life is too short, eternity is too long for us to neglect presenting the gospel. Let's be busy about that. There are nearly 5.8 million lost people in North Carolina. If you bring that closer to home, in Stokes County, they, in 19, 2019, Stokes County had a population of 45,591 people. We have about 60% of our county by the most figures that are determined to be lost. Without Christ, that would mean that in our county, 27,354 people do not know Jesus. That is, of all of our problems, the greatest problem that we face. Parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, sit with your children during this time and share the gospel with them. Let them know Jesus personally. That's so important. The greatest gift that you can give those that you love is the gospel. That's the greatest thing you can do for them. We all think about the things we leave for our children, our grandchildren. Leave them a legacy of the gospel. Jesus came to one man, and look at the difference that it made. I urge you to find that one person in your life and lead them to Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we have your word, a clear, unmistakable record of how much you love us and how you intervene in our day-to-day life. God, I, well, I don't know all the circumstances and situations that this message is heard today, but I pray that it'll fall on our heart for some to know how much you love us and care for us and desire salvation for us. And for others, Lord, to get beyond our own comfort and beyond the circle that we often operate in, to find the one person that others would shun. And in whatever way you lead us to bring them to Christ, Lord, I pray that you'll do that. Do that work among us. Do it as a church. Do it personally through your power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brother AJ is going to sing this beautiful hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Listen to the words of it. We have our altar here, and you can come here and pray at the altar. You can pray where you are. You can pray in your home. You can pray with your family. What a blessing that is. And if there's any blessing in all this time of the COVID virus, is that you can hold hands as a family and come together and pray together. I urge you'll do that. God bless you. Marvelous grace of our love. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured. There where the blood of the Lamb was.
was built grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater our sin dark is the stain that we cannot hide what can avail to wash it away look there is flowing a crimson tide whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater our sin. Listen to these words. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see His face. Will you this moment His grace receive? will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins.